safe. Do better. Where did you get it? Why would I tell you? Fury gave it to you. Why? What's on it? I don't know. Stop lying. I only act like I know everything, Rogers. I bet you knew Fury hired the pirates, didn't you? Well, it makes sense. The ship was dirty. Fury needed a way in. So do you. I'm not gonna ask you again. I know who killed Fury. Most of the intelligence community doesn't believe he exists. The ones that do call him the Winter Soldier. He's credited with over two dozen assassinations in the last 50 years. So he's a ghost story. Five years ago, I was escorting a nuclear engineer out of Iran. Somebody shot out my tires near Odessa. We lost control, went straight over a cliff. I pulled us out, but the Winter Soldier was there. I was covering my engineer, so he shot him straight through me. Soviet slug, no rifling. Bye-bye, bikinis. What If Marvel Episode 3, which I think is the best one. It's funny, isn't it? We start off with Captain Carter. It was a very good episode, solid, a Miro episode, I call it. And then Episode 2, which is a What If T'Challa was Star-Lord, which is an episode that sort of redefines a character as a whole. Yeah, so we've gone two different steps. One, which is a Miro. Episode 2, which is an envelope, completely rewritten character in the universe and then episode three which is its, its biggest yet it's everything being rewritten it's a complete overtell of the story this is done in such a massive way that the whole of the start of the avengers was completely different so the video that i showed you at the start and you know i like to do that because it adds a lot of context to my videos the angles that i'm going into really explains in terms of where they are with it you do see natasha natasha is actually talking to steve our alternate universe is Hope Van Dyne, aka the Wasp, that becomes a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent in this timeline, and she actually dies. So what we can sort of conclude from this is it was Hope that went to Odessa instead of Natasha on that deadly mission, Winter Soldier, Captain America, that Natasha had been tasked with escorting a nuclear engineer out of Iran during the mission. When she got to Odessa, she was attacked by Bucky Barnes, a Winter Soldier, and he shot her through the stomach and killed uh, the engineer that she was with. So what we can take from this setup now is that it was Hope Van Dyne who was killed. So Hank Pym's daughter never made it out. You know, she was important to him. We know how that relationship was when Scott, when we first meet Scott Lang. All of that is enveloped in how much he cares about her. He didn't really want to talk to Scott Lang because he was near his daughter. So Hank Pym was always very protective of his daughter. And he is a very complex character. And I'll talk about that later on in, in the review as we move forward. So the review starts, guys. What if the Avengers team was ripped apart by the sins of the past as well as the other MCU characters in this latest episode where the story would imagine... What happened if the world lost Earth's mightiest heroes, leaving Nick Fury to fend for himself? So this is before the Battle of New York ever happens. This is before the first Avengers movie. And you would have really a need to have watched the whole host of the Marvel Phase 1 Cinematic Universe to fully understand this episode and the Ant-Man movie plus Captain America Winter Soldier. Now, Jeffrey Wright is in this, of course, as, as uh, to the Watcher, returning to reprise his role... So is Samuel L. Jackson as Nick Fury, Jeremy Rayner as Hawkeye, Michael Douglas as Hank Ping, Tom Huddleston as Loki, Clark Gregg as Agent Carlson, Frank Grillo as Crossbones, Mark Ruffalo as Bruce Banner, and Jamie Alexander as Lady Sif. Now what's important is Mark Ruffalo as Bruce Banner is they actually shot these scenes to mirror the Incredible Hulk movie which was played by Edward Norton. But yet, they swap it in for Mark Ruffler, which I think is a really nice touch. Stepping in for Scarlett Johansson was Lake Bell. Guys, we know Lake Bell. Remember, she plays Poison Ivy in the amazing DC animated series of Harley Quinn. And replacing Robert Downey Jr. as Tony Stark is Mike Wingard as well. So it's not like everybody is back. There's one of few issues like there was last week with Star-Lord. Uh, but it's not the first time that he's actually played Iron Man. He's also played them in Iron Man, Avengers Assemble, Spider-Man, Guardians of the Galaxy cartoons, 
and the Marvel Future Avengers as well. And General Ross is being played by Mike McGill, not William Hurt. So there's actually quite a lot of places where they've had to swap some characters out. And I'm not sure why that, because this is really voiceovers. And I heard a couple of the voiceovers was done in lockdown. You don't have to be there. You can just be in a boot or you just can just record your lines. So episode three offers the opportunity to see a host of these returning MCU characters in a type of DC Elseworlds story. And the Nexus event is the death of Hope Van Dyne, who we talked about at the beginning of this review, and the retribution plan by her father, Hank Pym who becomes Yellow Jacket. And Yellow Jacket is weird, guys. It's a very controversial thing with Yellow Jacket. He's always been a symbol of his twisted mind. That's the reason why you know, we know Giant Man, we know Ant-Man. But the Yellow Jacket persona has always been that sort of twisted character. It's Marvel's most controversial moment, really, in the comics, which is where Henry Pym starts striking his wife, Janet. And that was actually in Avengers 213, where Hank Pym was operating under the alias Yellow Jacket and was reprimanded by the Avengers for his reckless behaviour during the battle as he used the sting of full force against the villains because he feels Nick Fury is responsible for the death of his daughter in this series, Hope. So first of all guys, out in the desert we see Agent Carlson, a complete mirror of the last scene, end of credits, going into the Thor movie of where he finds Monyo in the middle of the desert but Hawkeye is the guy who trains his bow and his finger slips and he accidentally kills four. And I say accidentally because he kept saying it wasn't me, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. So the God of Thunder is dead with a single arrow. And remember, Hawkeye killed him because what happened with Odin then is Odin stripped him of stripped four of his rightful ownership of Thor and Molyneux. So he didn't have the armor, he didn't have the armor. So that's the reason why in here we see him just die. Yes, he's strong and he takes out the soldiers and everything, but he's vulnerable because he is not Thor at his most powerful. He doesn't have the enchantment of the armor and Monio in his grasp, so he dies. And it leads on to a very difficult situation down the road. And also Hawkeye dies soon after that when he was in jail as he was sworn to have not killed Thor. So one thing leads to another, and that's when they realise something's going on here, and Nick Fury starts to get some undercover work done with Black Widow. So Natasha tracks down Betty Ross for help with Tony Stark's suspicious death. Betty explains that the antidote and the syringe wasn't the cause of it, but Banner is hiding in her lab, and that's where we see that Bruce kind of hawks out and suddenly explodes in the midst of General Ross of the ambush. It's the same ambush that we see in the Incredible Hulk movie, which is played by Edward Norton. We discover that Hulk 2 gets killed, and we don't know how, but he just explodes in this rage of gamma radiation. Very strange for the Hulk character. But Thor's death attracted Loki and the Asgardian army, who threatened to invade Earth. Fury strikes a bargain with Loki, hoping to uncover the person responsible for the murders and the death before Loki proceeds with his evil plans. It's really weird here because it's later discovered that Hank Pym, as I said previously, is behind the deaths of the Avengers. He assassinated them all in an act of revenge following the death of his daughter, Hulk Van Dyne, who died while carrying out the mission which I spoke about. So the Hulk, we always thought, could never be killed but that Hank was able to shrink into a tiny size using his technology to enlarge Hulk's heart and cells, producing these pin particles to enlarge him. And he just explodes. He just bang, he just explodes. But today's episode, guys, was the darkest we've ever seen in the twists of What If. And really, for me, this kind of reminds me of my favorite comic. I've talked about this all the time. It's What If... The Punisher kills a Marvel Universe, and what if Deadpool kills a Marvel Universe? And in those comments, it shows you exactly how all of these guys get taken out. I remember when the Punisher killed Hulk. He actually killed him when he was in Banner's form, which is where he's most vulnerable. And he just goes around taking everybody out. And it just goes to show you in a way that he can actually do that because he's a trained soldier. And that was what Frank Castle achieved in the comics. Here, it's a little bit more elaborate because of... Pim particles and the fact that Hank Pym is a genius in terms of biology 
He knew everything. He knew exactly what to do by flying into people's bodies and taking them out that way. There was also a joke that he flied, uh, Ant-Man flight into Thanos' butt and took him out that way. It kind of reminded me of when we saw the boys where they had the invisible guy who was intangible and he was like, my skin's tough, you can't hurt me and nothing you can do to pierce my skin. Then they had the idea to put a grenade up his backside and explode him from within. So it kind of sort of set in a little joke in terms of how this paid off, which I thought was quite a bit funny. In my opinion, because of that is why I think this is the best episode far, because it, this episode really tells you what the comics were like. This is as good as my favorite comic in terms of what if Punisher killed the Marvel Universe. The final battle seemingly pits a very capable Nick Fury against Ant-Man. And you see Hank Pym fighting Nick Fury. Nick Fury is disappearing and he's stopping the punches at every turn. And so it turns out, you kind of realise when you see him vanishing that it actually isn't Nick Fury. It turns out that it's Loki, the trickster. And behind Nick Fury's fighting prowess, Loki is the one that defeats Ant-Man and takes Hank Pym into Asgardian custody. And Loki then decides to take the original path he had which is, I'm going to take over Earth. He always said that Earthlings were there to be conquered. And he steps in and takes command of the entire planet, forcing everyone to be a servant, which was his original plan in the movie. And as this plan is implemented, the Avengers take a different stance because there's no Avengers to stop him. The show actually ends with Nick Fury hunting down Captain America, who is in the ice, and also searching through the pager now i want to talk about the pager because it's really weird the pager was only ever revealed after things went really bad in infinity war that when people started after the snap when they started vanishing all around the globe around the universe and everything else that's the first time we saw the pager the pager actually wasn't brought up until in the mid 90s the fact that he gave her the pager wasn't known until after Avengers Infinity War because the Captain Marvel movie was an in-between sort of refresher of Infinity War and Endgame. But previously before that, we never knew about the pager. And you have to wonder why nothing was ever brought up previously before that he had this sort of doomsday device, this last minute.com kind of failsafe in Captain Marvel. It was never really known about. But we see it here, he opens up his glove compartment, just as he thinks things are going out of hand. He opens up the glove compartment and he sees that the page is in there. He, he, he kind of pushes to go and use it. And he thinks, hold on a second, let me make this deal with Loki. Maybe that might work out. So you can see that in this episode that he's always had that. He's always had the contingency plan of that pager. And that's something which I liked because that kind of wasn't really paid off in the movies. It, this came out of nowhere. It was like, whoa. What is this pager? And then you see the icon of Captain Marvel. That's why when the snap happened and everyone turned to dust, her pager got sent off. Here, she's been brought to Earth much quicker than that. So you kind of have an Avengers team of Captain America. You're going to have Falcon. You are going to have a Black Panther as well because the Wakanda situation was before this event. It was before the Captain America Winter Soldier movie, so T'Challa's still around, Falcon's still around, even though Tony Stark's dead, we've got James Rhodes who's still around who wants to avenge him. We won't have Hope, Thor and Hawkeye, those, those guys won't be there, and you probably would have had Florence Pugh as the new Black Widow as well, so the team would have still kind of found its way. Also, I'd like to mention that this had nothing to do with the Ultron situation, so Hydra was still going to enact its plan, in Winter Soldier, which meant Ultron still would have had his way, which meant Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch would have been Avengers in that reign as well. So they would have been on the team. I probably would have think, my wild guess is Hercules would have been on the team as well, because Hercules wasn't an Asgardian, he was an Olympian. And he was the one that was always going toe to toe. One time when he had a fight with Thor, they fought for seven days straight in the comics. And I think that in the MCU, they would have found a way to have him in the team to be their big muscle because the Avengers' big muscle is Hulk and Thor, and they were both dead. So somebody of that stature would have been able to sort of beat the big man, the strong man. And in my opinion, that would have been Hercules. Guys, really good episode. So happy with this. My favorite yet. I'm going to give this a 9 
I think that this is as close as my favourite comic to enjoying what I saw as a what if. This is for me, this is a true what if, as, as good as anything I've read in the comics. And I really do like it. The fact that it's akin to the MCU makes it all the much better. Guys, thanks for joining me. If you enjoyed this video, hit a like on that like button and subscribe to the channel. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace out.